One of the greatest inventions of the modern world is the advent of the electrical grid. With the simple flip of a light switch, I can turn on a light pretty much anywhere in the country and magically we have light. It's undoubtedly the greatest invention of the 19th century. It came out at the very end of it in the late 1800s. And it's something that we totally take for granted, but absolutely makes our lives amazing. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about how the electrical grid works, how the demand side of it works and how the supply side of it works. And the reason why I'm talking about this is as we can understand the electrical grid, we can understand what the true best form of power really is. But in order to really understand that, you have to understand how all the various pieces work. And we're going to cover some of these extra topics as we move along to really understand how all of the various forms of electricity that are available work and how we can make things even better than they are. So first, let's talk about how the grid works. Now, here in the United States, we have an alternating current standard. In fact, the whole world has an alternating current standard. That means that the signal goes up and down, up and down. The frequency and the voltage changes depending on exactly where you are, but it has the same general pattern throughout the world. The reason why alternating current is chosen is it's very easy to change the voltage from a higher to a lower voltage. And that allows you to run a low voltage in a house, which is much, much safer than a high voltage, but you can run a high voltage line when you're going between houses or between cities and connect things up so that you can save electricity. The amount of power in a line is equal to the current times the voltage. These are some terms that you don't really have to know everything to understand. And then there's a law called Ohm's law that voltage equals the current times the resistance. When you put these together, the really important piece is the higher the voltage you have, the lower the current is, and the lower the current is, the less resistance gets in the way. All wire has some form of resistance, which will slow the electricity down. And as a result, you just can't simply get as much energy over a low voltage line. It just won't go very far because before too long, it'll have no voltage left in it and you really don't want that. So we have this really complex system with different tiers at different voltages. Now, here at my house, we have 120 volts because I live in the United States at 60 Hertz. And that's the standard throughout the entire country. We have four different electrical grids in the United States and Canada. One of them is entirely in Quebec. One of them is entirely in Texas. And the other two are the eastern and western parts of the United States and Canada. We share the grid between the two. Uh, starting at my house, now all of the houses in my neighborhood will essentially share the same signal. We'll have the same transformer that will transform it from a much higher voltage that goes between houses through the city to just our neighborhood. I live in a townhome, so all of the homes in my row share the same transformer. It's about seven houses and it's pretty much the same thing regardless of where you are you can look for these little green boxes at least here in the united states that they're pretty much everywhere as you start to go into the larger grids then the voltages become much higher the voltage in my house is 120 volts we have up to 240 volts that's available for things like my dryer charging my electric car and a few things like that the air conditioning as you start to get into the even higher voltages, though, you're able to transmit for a few miles without losing too much power. And that tends to be the ones that we see most often. These power lines are, you know, roughly tree height. Many of them are made out of wood. In my particular neighborhood, they run those lines underground, which is much safer because basically this area is a forest that has a house is built in so you'd be at risk for a lot of damage if you had them above ground so they put them below ground where they can plus that way you don't have the side of power lines which a lot of people don't like to see but some of the neighborhoods they'll be a little bit more visible when i lived in arizona they were quite visible because it just didn't matter that much 
Now these power lines that go through the city have to be within about three or four miles of a much higher voltage signal or else they would lose too much power. So if you trace those along, you'll eventually find a really high voltage power line. And they're transferred through a big giant transformer that is the size of practically a house to these lower voltages. And you'll see these substations, as they're called, periodically throughout a city. And they're always connected between very, very high voltage lines and lower voltage signals. And you'll see them quite frequently all over the place if you start to notice them. Now, most of the power stations that are out there will be connected to this grid, this higher power grid, that will allow them to transmit the power to everywhere that we need it. And technically speaking, when I go and flip on a light switch, I'm getting electricity here in the eastern part of the United States from all the way down to Florida, all the way up to Canada. It's all coming into my house. Now, practically speaking, because of the distances involved, the more local power sources are providing the majority of that power. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not getting some from everything that is connected to the grid. It's a pretty amazing system. Let's talk about the demand side. Now, the grid is amazingly resilient. And one of the big things that's resilient on it is the fact that there's so many different devices connected to it that if I go and flip on this light switch, this light happens to be 85 watts, the amount of power that is available is absurdly huge. Now all of this electricity has to be created the same instant that it is used. You can't store electricity unless you do it through batteries. And we're starting to have more batteries on the grid and we also have something called pumped hydro storage and a few other exotic means of storing power. But for the most part, when you generate electricity, it's used the same time that it is produced. But like a river, there's a constant amount of electricity that's always flowing through. And so even if you have a boat that's being pushed down by the river, it may slow down a river a little bit. It's not really going to make a huge difference to the overall flow of it. It's very similar with electricity. What actually happens when I go and flip on a new load? Let's say instead I'm charging my Tesla Model 3 at a supercharger station. That uses a, quite a bit of power, actually into the tens of kilowatts of power per second, even 250, I think, is the amount that you can charge with a V3 charger of kilowatts. That's actually a significant amount of power. Now, there's gigawatts of power that are available, but it's still enough to cause a dent. And what actually happens? Well, imagine that you're riding on a bicycle, one of the old fashioned ones that you have to sit there and pedal, pedal, pedal all the time. You can't just stop and rest like my current bike will do. What happens when you're going on a flat surface is you're pedaling and you're pushing just as hard to keep going the same speed. As you start to go uphill just a little bit, then you're still pushing just as hard, but you're going to start to slow down because of this extra demand that is being put on the signal. And the frequency, therefore, will start to slow down. The same kind of thing happens with the electric grid. When you turn on a new load, it will tend to slow down the frequency that it's operating on a little bit. And the people who are responsible for managing the grid, they'll pay attention to the lowering signal. If it lowers enough, then they know, hey, we need to flip on a new power supply. And the grid is managed all the time. See, there are some predictions that are made of the amount of demand that we're using. And here I'll show one day's example they predict based off of the temperature how much electricity is going to be used. They predict off of the day of the week and different things like that that factor into it if it's a holiday. And usually they're able to make a pretty good estimate. You can see in this particular day, it's pretty close actually to what they actually used, but they're not always perfect. They have to understand these patterns though to do this. The different power sources will bid on it, but we'll talk about that when we get to the supply side of things. It's pretty amazing how all of these different factors have to be taken into account when you're making the electrical grid. Now, how does the typical demand look? Well, we can take into account the different seasons because it varies quite a bit and the different times of the day. And I've got a plot here that will show, depending on which month, what the power usage actually is.
Now, the peak electrical use happens during the summer because we use AC in the summer and that takes a lot of electricity, at least here in the United States. The demand is the highest in the summer during the evening hours between about 5 and 10 o'clock. This is the time when people go home, they're turning on their ovens, they're turning on their AC. During the earlier hours of this, people may still be at work, so the work has to have its AC running. And as a result, this is the absolute peak, is the evening hours. In the winter, they still have this evening peak, although it's shifted a little bit, but they also have a morning peak at between about six o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning when people are getting up, getting ready for work, maybe using their hot water heaters and otherwise using more electricity than they would be normally. So you have to take into account these peaks and flows. If you pay based off of the time of day, you'll pay less for electricity during these off peak hours, during the late night hours, for instance, than you would during the evening hours in the summer. And this helps the electricity to be optimally configured. It'll make it so that, for instance, you don't have to use this one power plant that you only have to run it for a particular few hours during the day, a few days a year. Because that's really, really expensive to maintain an entire power plant just for that use. You really want to lower the number of power plants to maximize the use. And so this is how our demand works. Now, how does the supply work? Well, as I previously mentioned, there are a number of organizations that will manage the predicted load for the grid. And they take into account a couple of different things. They are using their various models to predict how much energy we're actually going to use at a particular time of the day. And they will go and auction this out, typically a day in advance. So all of the power plants in the area will say, okay, it costs me this amount to produce a megawatt of energy, and I can produce this amount based off of what time of the day it is. So a solar power plant will show the peak, the energy during the middle of the day. A solar power plant doesn't cost anything to run. In fact, you may actually make money just for having it available. So you actually will profit just by having it on. What they'll do is they'll all bid all of these together and then they'll use the cheapest ones up until the point where they have to have this power plant that is costing a whole bunch to run, but it's absolutely required to get the load for that particular point in time. That peak power plant is called marginal. The reason why is they're just barely making the margin. They're paying as much as it costs to make the electricity as they're actually going to receive. But all power plants will receive that. So your solar power plant or your wind power plant that doesn't really cost anything to run, they'll make more money during that period of time because they're actually able to get the same amount that a fossil fuel plant that requires some very expensive fuel to run gets, but they don't have any costs, but they all get paid the same amount. And that's how the grid works. Now, they also have to predict what the peak demand is going to be because you really don't want to have a situation where you don't have enough electricity for a given day. And so they will pay a certain amount just to keep a facility in working order and they will similarly auction that out. Now, this can actually lead to some interesting complications where when you have a very capital intensive but cheap form of electricity, such as solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, that these cost a lot to set up, but once you're going, it's not really costing very much, if anything at all. What happens is power plants that don't cost very much to build tend to be the ones that we end up building more of because they get the funds to do this capital intensive thing. Your solar power plant is gonna make the same amount of money in the long run, but it's a lot less secure thing. And if we actually had a situation where we were powering entirely with solar power that doesn't cost anything, then none of these solar power plants are gonna make any money at all. And it's just absolutely crazy. There's all kinds of things that they do to try to make this. The most common one is they will guarantee a certain amount of price for a particular point in time. 
they'll say, hey, we guarantee you solar power plant that we're always going to pay you at least $50 per megawatt hour, for instance. And that's just how they'll work. So they know that they're going to do that. They can go take that to the bank to get a finance to be able to build it. Without that kind of guarantee, it's very, very difficult to finance these things. Whereas a natural gas power plant, they can actually have the guarantee just based off this capital expenditure alone to get most of it guaranteed. And so they'll be able to build their plant without any kind of problems. This is a surprisingly difficult problem. If you want to use a capitalistic system where people can go bid on all of this to make a competitive environment for everyone, it's very, very difficult. And this is a problem that academics are trying to study right now. I don't have a solution to this. I've thought about a lot of different things and I can't come up with anything. It's people who know a lot more about this and a lot smarter than me about this have tried to do the same thing and they haven't figured this out either. So it's a really interesting problem and I'll link to some other resources where you can go look more into this if you want to in the description below, but it's something you might want to consider. Now, these different power plants, they have different things that they'll do. The loads tend to be for like a base load. So there's a certain amount of electricity that we're just always going to use for our refrigerators, for the lights that are up. We're always going to have a certain minimum amount of electricity needed. And that's called the base load. The base load, 24 hours a day, nuclear tends to use, be used a lot for this, but you can also use coal and natural gas very easily and hydroelectric as well. Some of these power sources can be varied a lot more. Now a coal or natural gas, you can just put more coal, more natural gas in and you'll be able to produce more electricity. Nuclear power, you can't ramp it up and down very much. You'll have some power plants that will be a contingent power plant just in case something really, really bad happens. If you have a really, really hot day, if you have a major power plant that fails during this really hot day, then maybe you'll flip on this contingent power plant. And then you have variable power plants like the solar power and the wind that if the wind's not blowing, you're not getting anything out of your wind power plant. This last type, the renewables are really difficult to factor into everything. You just can't take it all into account really easily because you're going to have to vary some of these other power plants to be able to get this all to work. You have to rely on something that will turn on and off quickly. And these actually tend to be natural gas. Now, if we have enough battery storage, then that will help. But there again, the solar power plants can have enough power storage to be able to last through the night. But what do you have happen if the wind dies? The wind can die for three weeks sometimes, and that can cause a huge strain on the grid. So you have to be prepared for these kinds of eventualities. Balancing all of these concerns out is a surprisingly difficult problem. And it's something that I'm going to talk a little bit more over the coming months as to what I think is the ultimate best source of electricity. And I have a feeling right now, I haven't done all the research, that it's going to be some kind of a balance between them. But as we are working to reduce things like carbon emissions, pollution, and make things more sustainable in the long run, these are some questions that we have to understand. So let's talk more about this. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have. If you want to talk about this kind of stuff, come join me in my Discord. And we are talking about sustainable electricity all the time. Uh, also about space exploration stuff. If you want to help fund my efforts here, you can become a Patreon and help fund all of the various upgrades that I have here. Thank you guys so much for everything, even just for watching, subscribing, all of that kind of stuff. It's without you guys that I couldn't do this. Thank you. Until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.